talks and discussion with Professor Sandra Lubarski, who recently retired from oh. Appalachian University. That's right. <laughs> applause, applause. <laughs> And you can yeah. find the rest of her uh, bio, obviously, in the bio. But you need to stop working. The game of doesn't matter. It's <laughs> 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 hey, but yeah. well, Thank you for having me here. And this is such a joy to be here. I actually um, presented it probably a more formal presentation, so bear with me, but I'll try to work through it quickly. I see that I have. Um, uh, introduced uh, Wendell Berry as Endel Berry, but this is a quote from Wendell Berry, the essayist and writer, and he says in his book, Life is a Miracle, we ought consciously to reduce our tolerance for ugliness. Why, if we are in fact progressing, should so much expense and effort have resulted in so much ugliness? We ought to begin to ask ourselves, what are the limits of scale, of speed, and probably expense as well, beyond which human work is bound to be ugly? And the ugliness that I want to focus on and that I'm focusing on and the book I'm working on on beauty and sustainability is the ugliest ugliness that we've done to the natural world. And just quickly, a couple slides on this. Um, for example, this is the ugliness that comes from the process of beheading a mountain. <coughs> Mountaintop removal in the Appalachians. And um, if you haven't seen this, it's quite disturbing. Uh, this is an image from the resource pillaging that's going on. Many of you are familiar in the Alberta Tar Sands. So on the right is uh, the, uh, that moss that uh, uh, grows there that uh, is being under by surface mining. And again, the Alberta tar sands. And um, even the worker camps are, it's interesting how that gets that industrial ugliness gets um, trans translated into the uh, built environment there as well. And then, of course, we have in the last 20 years, all the fracking process that's been going on for 60 years, in the last 20 years, especially gas and oil extraction in the U.S., has uh, left this kind of pockmarked um, maps all across the U.S., from Pennsylvania to Oklahoma, and even to California. So that's the context for this. In conversations about sustainability, though, we rarely hear talk about ugliness beauty. Though it was beauty that clearly motivated the early conservationists. If you think about the Hudson River artists, the romantic poets, of course, John Muir, they were all motivated by beauty. Um, but the contemporary conversation has focused largely on resource use, on efficiency, and on management. And uh, with very hesitant and noticeably ephemeral references to to a large extent, of course, as you all know, this is because most people still are nurtured on and have accepted the modernist worldview, the mechanistic worldview. How beauty became eviscerated, how it was domesticized and feminized, uh, I'm sorry, domesticated and feminized, separated from the sublime, how it came to be subsumed under the general category of value and then neglected and ultimately rejected as anything more than subjective opinion is a complicated chapter in the history of modernity. And the fact that this chapter is rarely spoken of is, of course, a evidence of the triumph of modernity. And so heading into a conversation about beauty is like free climbing the face of El Capitan. <laughs> Not that I have <laughs> metaphor only. Propelled only by our vivid images of beauty, we actually, we undertake a set of difficult technical sequences, focused on the ascent more than the summit, and refusing to deny the obvious, that the world is filled with beauty. We, we seek cracks in the modern worldview for our handholds and footholds. And one of the most important handholds has been Whitehead's worldview. And what has been described as his 
outrageously hyperbolic claim that the teleology of the universe is directed towards the production of beauty. But this claim is not hyperbolic or outrageous. It only sounds that way to ears that have been tuned to the modernist, materialist, mechanistic worldview. So just quickly, I don't think I really need to remind all of you here his wife has basic ideas about beauty, but I'm going to run through them very quickly. Okay. Um, the first, of course, is that Whitehead's entire philosophy is based on a reintroduction of value into the world. And for Whitehead, the very process of coming to be is an aesthetic process. That process, of course, is the process of making <coughs> a coherent unity out of the unfathomable array of uh, facts and possibilities. Um, it involves a series of inclusions and exclusions of correspondences and contrasts, all with the goal of integrating the details of the past into a novel composition, into what Whitehead called an aesthetic synthesis. <coughs> Whitehead's summary of this process is his, short, is his short definition of beauty. Beauty is the mutual adaptation of the several factors and an occasion. Although everything is an aesthetic process, and every concrescence is finally the realization of a definite shape of value, the achievement of beauty is not guaranteed. And this is because the mutual adaptation that Whitehead has in mind involves something called strength of experience. It has to do with the, the relation of part to whole, in which the parts gain intensity from the whole, so that the um, I'm sorry, so that the parts gain intensity from the whole so that their individuality is intensified at the same time that they contribute to the complexity, massiveness, and overall coherence of the whole. This description is a version of the process by which the many become one and are increased by one. And uh, White tells us that this process yields the major form of beauty. Whitehead's primary and practically only example of the principle of uh, this, this relationship of part to whole is the cathedral at Chart. Where he says, and this is in description of the nine portals, there are those statues, each with their own individuality, and all lending themselves to the beauty of the whole. this relationship of dynamic mutuality, the overall intensity of experience is strengthened. But there's another element that's critical to the coming to be of beauty. In addition to the vividness of individual events attained by variety, harmony, and contrast, and the complex whole to which they contribute, Whitehead connects beauty with spontaneity and originality. He speaks of the beauty attained in a compressing occasion as as dependent, quote, both on the objective content from which the occasion arises and also on the spontaneity of the occasion. The way he gives much attention to the relations of parts to whole and individual to environment, he insists that beauty requires the addition of spontaneity and originality. And so beauty is not simply the adaptation, the mutual adaptation of the several factors in the in an occasion of experience. It also involves the unpredictability of novelty that is the defining feature of life. The coordinated spontaneity, spontaneity that adds to the vividness of individuality and creates a fresh coherence. Hence, beauty is the primary value associated with life. But here's the problem, alas, Despite the fact that beauty is fundamental to Whitehead's philosophy of organism, and despite the fact that it is central to the rebuttal, his rebuttal to mechanism, Whitehead's writing on beauty has often been glossed over as a way to talk about value in general. And when the idea of beauty that is, um, and often the idea of beauty has been reduced to intensity of experience, without much understanding of what this actually means. Indeed, Whitehead's writing on beauty is so abstract as to be easy to set aside and difficult to apply. And here is my, uh, uh, 
this is my case in point, if you'll just read this. This is why head beauty is the internal confirmation of the various items of experience with each other for the production of maximum effectiveness. Beauty thus concerns the interrelations of the various components of reality and also the interrelations of the various components of appearance and also the relations of appearance to reality. That's any part of experience can be beautiful. <laughs> you may be the only people in this, in this world who understands what he has said here. So um, Whitehead gives us a metaphysical foundation okay, for the importance of beauty, but he doesn't give us a handbook for how beauty functions in our daily lives. Much as I love Whitehead and what he has said about beauty, and if I were gonna get a tattoo, it would be the teleology of the universe. Um, I have a couple of my husband said, yes, but where? <laughs> I have felt like someone who's been given the principles of swimming but has never actually gotten wet. And so um, when I read Christopher Alexander, the architect, I felt like I'd been tossed a floating device. And what I'm suggesting here is that Christopher Alexander, the architect, gives us visual forms and visual presentations for how to, um, how to see what Whitehead's saying in his metaphysics. So, Alexander, like Whitehead, sees beauty as the linchpin for overcoming the mechanism and overcoming the bifurcations of the world. And like Alex, uh, Whitehead, Alexander says, what is the process of promoting life? But Alexander's an architect, and the medium in which he works out his answer is the physical world. And he does this, I think, and as he does this, he gives visible form to Whitehead's metaphysics, illustrating and extending Whitehead's more abstract discussion. Alexander is widely known, uh, do many of you know Alexander's book, The Pattern Language? Okay, so, so that's an underground classic. But in, um, and he wrote that in 1977. But in 2002, he put, put out four volumes um, of essays called The Nature of Order. And that is where he talks about his, um, his philosophy of architecture and actually builds a philosophy of a process philosophy. So let me show you a, a few slides of what Alexander calls dead and deadening structures. This is one of them. And what he's trying to figure out is why are some structures dead and some alive? And how do you engender life in the physical world? Uh, this is another, um, you see it? And, and here, this is in Rotterdam. Maybe some of you have seen this. These are all dead? These are dead. <laughs> hey, just one thousand. <laughs> and I'll give you here's a couple of examples of living now, okay. the live buildings. So here's a Norwegian uh, traditional building. Uh, this is actually a building that uh, Alexander built. And he likes these, these two. On the right is a Frank Lloyd Wright, and on the left there's Alex and Paris. Actually, Alex apartments. So the question that he's asking repeatedly is, why is that dead, and why is that living? And, and what are the principles for making this happen? What are the patterns, what are the relationships? And what I have found, because I know I'm running out of time, is that those relationships that he describes are very similar to the way that Whitehead talks in this very abstract way about contrast, about rhythms, um, and, and et cetera. So let me just quickly tell you that um, Alexander believes if the um, if, if mechanistic uh, worldview is reject is jettisoned, then you can build living buildings. To make good architecture, he says, we must fundamentally alter our, our idea about the nature of order, about the kind of thing it is, and that idea of the nature of order Alexander realizes is aligned with Whitehead. In fact, at various times, he cites Whitehead in <coughs> these four volumes. Uh, he also makes an error insofar as he says, um, I believe that we shall, I believe that we shall not have a credible view that shows how human life and architecture are related until Whitehead's bifurcation is dissolved. But then he goes on and says, Whitehead's problem 
remains unsolved today. So I think he didn't, I think he stopped reading Whitehead and kept doing architecture. I think it's fair to say that Alexander is, after all, a professional architect and an amateur philosopher. Um, but I think, and I, so I think there's ways in which Whitehead, if Alexander, if we can connect Alexander to uh, Whitehead, it's going to improve, it's going to clarify Whitehead's, Alexander's thinking. At the same time, he gives visual form to, to Whitehead. So let me just give you a Sandra, may I yeah. ask just a little bit more about that quotation? Do you think that when he says that uh, the bifurcation is the bifurcation that Whitehead identified, it's not a bifurcation in Whitehead's thinking? Oh, Whitehead. No, it's the, it's the bifurcation that he's Which, identified. Yes, he's speaking uh, in, in exactly about Nature Alive, Nature Dead, those particular essays. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. How am I doing? Uh, finish. <laughs> finish. Oh, no. <laughs> well, hold on, okay? <laughs> Here's what he's found, that there are 15 principles of living structures. He's done this, it, so he has now, he has spent about 40 years looking at objects and trying to figure out what is going on in these objects, taking two objects at a time and saying, which one has more life? And trying to figure out what are the patterns that are present there. And he's come up with these 15 patterns. Uh, the, many of them, again, echo Whitehead. So you've got patterns of repetition. You've got patterns of dark light contrast, strong borders, strong boundaries, positive space a deep interlock and ambiguity. He also later on talks about color. He's got 11 principles of color that mimic these same patterns. Um, but the, the most important pattern for him actually is strong centers. And by strong centers, they are places with dense energy, fundamental units of living structure, and he equates those with Whitehead's notions of organ this is a postmodern house that clearly, he says, has it lacks strong centers, and that's why it's dead. Living structure and the whole fabric of life is made of centers, intensifying centers. And that is the primary relationship here. And he gives you then an example on these tiles of how um, boundaries and white space and repetition all, all intensify the center. Uh, and this is an example of how you build centers. But so much of, I think, the way Whitehead talks about the, the way life works is in centers relating to centers, the individual centers strengthening the whole fabric, and the whole fabric then strengthening the individual centers. But here we've got a visual for it. And he goes back, in fact, he, quote, he goes back and look at, looks at his chart, finds the same thing and says, We've got millions and millions of centers here. All the folds of the fabric, those are centers. The space in between, those are centers. And they're all building this kind of living structure. Um, the, the last thing I'll say just quickly is that he has developed what's called the mirror of self-test. And I wasn't, I, it's a, as I read this to my husband, he said, don't go there. You'll lose your audience. But I, then I realized yesterday, no, I won't. Um, <laughs> because in the mirror of self-test, again, he's looking at thousands and thousands of objects over a long period of time. And he taught architecture at the University of uh, California, Berkeley. So he had hundreds and hundreds of students that he tested on. And he said, if, if you ask yourself, so he believes that there is a selfness to the world. There's, there's an I-ness. There's subjectivity in the world. And he has divide this, devised this test that, uh, that is a practice for open, opening ourselves to that I-ness that is present in the physical structure of things. And he, he asks us then to look at two buildings, for example, or two any objects, and ask, which of these is more who I am? Sometimes he asks, which of these is my eternal self? That's an unprocessed question, I know. Um, uh, but uh, which of these uh, will I meet when I die? I mean, I mean, he's trying to find language to talk about this subjectivity that's present in the, in the physical environment. 
and he will argue that uh, the ones on the right, on the left, the uh, Corbusier here, has more life than the uh, than the Van der Rohe. And here's another. Now this time the Van der Rohe has more life than the <laughs> Corbusier. But but what is so interesting it is a practice that he's given us to develop this kind of sensitivity to subjectivity in the world, and in that way, a sensitivity to beauty. And I'll just end by reading my last paragraph and urging you to read his four volumes. And that is that um, there is um, not a one-to-one -one correlation between Whitehead and Alexander. Um, the, um, but they are mutually supportive of one another, and together they help us mold beauty from the margins to the center of our concern. And in doing so, it's my opinion that we will find ways to intentionally practice beauty, and as with any practice, we will become more sensitive, more discriminating, more passionate, and more, and more adept at protecting and encouraging beauty in the world. And we will recognize with, with Whitehead and Alexander the importance of beauty to moving beyond mechanism and toward a more, more robust understanding of sustainability. So thanks. We have some time for questions, observations, provocations. Thank you, Sandra. Very interesting how and provoking. And we were talking, I was thinking of Gaudi. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Sagrada Familia, which is, uh, she studied also in his own terms, natural organisms, and Sagrada Familia is an incredible building. I think it's very much alive, and it's a monster of concrete, which is the opposite of what I usually would associate with a sustainable thing, and many of the, the, the houses that he built were upper class places. So I, I ju was just wondering, because this I wasn't asked to myself at the time, how does that work together <clears throat> at that point? Like, yeah, I, I'd be very interested to take these principles and look at, at Casa, many of the houses that he's done at Parkwell, at yeah, exactly. Sagrada Familia. Um, and I, um, you know, um, it's not, he, he does believe, he, he's, he's loose, okay, he's much looser than Whitehead. So that sometimes he talks about this life that's actually in the, the electronic life that's in all the, all the material. Sometimes he talks about the, it's not so much that there's a livingness in the building as that it evokes livingness in us because we are in tune with the patterns that are being presented. And these are, these are patterns that are part of the, actually the structure of the natural world and the structure of reality. So in, in, that's the way in which he's talking about how you build life into a building. Uh, you know, he doesn't he doesn't lift up any of get any Gaudi as far as I you know. I don't know why. Well, it seems this is very much linked to cognitive psychology as well, too, where you can take uh, you can take visual images of letters, maybe uh, you can give people words that sound harsh or words that sound really soft and calm, and you can you can actually manipulate or influence the so I guess that brings me to wonder, in the pictures that we're looking at, he's showing mm -hmm. some sharp edges on some things, showing, you know, uh, patterns to be in other things, flowing patterns to be in <coughs> It seems like our brains are hardwired to interpret things. Uh, well, what we know, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm being too, we know that our brains are hardwired to interpret things, such as hard edges, and we can take them into psychological things. So is that subjectivity in the world? Or is that we are, there's some sort of wiring involved. There's some sort of symbi symbiosis involved where we are wired to feel those products in the world and to respond to them in a certain way. I don't know. Yeah, That's I'll tell you that Alexander speaks very directly uh, against that, that it's not a cognitive, it's not, it's not simply a cognitive construction. It's not simply a psychological um, consequence. That, that there really are these patterns that are the way that space gets defined, yeah. and that you, and that and those patterns, it's 
Yeah, I, so I actually think that's right. Or they are embedded in the natural world. It's the way life came to right. construct and to be constructed. That those are patterns that are sustaining of life. So that when we when we are given those, when we're giving objective data, that's part of what we're given. Are this patterns over and over again. So of course, so he would work that way. So of course, it's going to change. This mode of approaching beauty would be actually building a cemented building towards <coughs> savings. It's a so, great question, and I. Um, so when he did that book, the pattern language. There, so there's 253 patterns that he put out there, and people all over the world use those patterns to build their own homes. And but what he found was. Oftentimes, the homes weren't living. They didn't. They didn't. They didn't have that freshness. They didn't have that because people were just simply repeating the patterns, and and that is what sparked him then to realize there's something more going on than in the the structure of things, and and led him to start talking about this softness in the world, the I-ness that, and sometimes he uses the word God. Sometimes he uses ground of being, but that there is something more. There's some novelty, originality, also life. There, that I mean, really, some some spirit that is in addition to the pattern. Yeah. 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 We have about time for one or two more. <coughs> Just a quick comment. Oliver Stewart does an interesting documentary called "Why Beauty Matters," and he spends a Good portion of on architecture. He wants to first draw the distinction between subjective and objective sort of notions of beauty, whether it's really out there, whether it's just subjectively in our minds, but also between um, architecture being actually aesthetically inclined or being much more pragmatic and therefore less important to us. And he talks about educational institutions who traditionally, uh, if we look at Pomona, school theology is lovely to a certain extent, right? But if we go down to Pomona, there's the architecture in terms of value is definitely most. So I wonder maybe as a general question, since some of the conversations have been about um, the role of education going forward in the sense last in various conversations, what role does beauty have in education, in architecture, as humanity moves forward? So as we rethink education environments of learning and whether we're more inclined to learn differently in environments that are more in place for students, if we can do that. Maybe just a general. Well, you know, I think White Ed was, I can't, I'm in line with White Ed, Christopher Alexander says, it matters to our psyches where we spend our time. And um, we are, you know, we are affected by our environment. So yeah, the fact that we build beauty, buildings that aren't beautiful does really um, hurt our, hurt our abilities and of course, you know, efficiency and um, um, economic constraints have been the, the guiding rules for architecture, that and ego, of course. So he really, so just quickly, um, so Alexander taught for uh, many, many years at Berkeley and made many, many enemies. 
at the very at end of his four volume series, he thanks his colleagues who gave him so much grief for decades. And um, including, I think he had a lawsuit at some point, because they were so opposed to his introducing this kind of white Hedian philosophy to architecture. Because they were so immersed in that mechanistic worldview and in the constraints of building, well, and, and in uh, building, being the artistic genius and um, the expertise, the professionalism of the field, and then, of course, the cost issues. But, but James Hillman, you know, the young, young says, don't you think it takes a toll for us every day to spend our whole day under fluorescent lights? And uh, with the sound of um, the Xerox machines in the background and artificial plants, and go home along a freeway or edgeway with fast food and strip malls, don't you think that takes a, a toll on us? Yeah. Unfortunately, we're running out of time, so if people want to just make very brief comments, uh, and we'll mm -hmm. take a few of those comments, and if there's anything you want to say as a summation point uh, from Eric. Okay. Just one brief comment about, at the beginning you were talking about John Muir and all these poets and all that. Earlier than that, Alexander von Humboldt mm -hmm. was already um, presenting an image of the world that then influenced poets. There's a new book by a, a woman by the last name of Wolf. Uh, Catherine sent me the review, and I went and bought it immediately, because when she tells me that I do that, and it's called The Invention of Nature. Oh, yes. And so I highly commend it to everybody. Mm -hmm. I think von Humboldt was forgotten for a long time, but the 250th anniversary of his birth is coming in 2019. Oh, thank you. And of course, <laughs> Coleridge, uh, you know, Whited was reading that, the romantic poets too, but yeah. trees, which sounds like a really beautiful thing, trees, but the local people that lived there, they, were, they saw the tree planted, they were like, well, our rent just went up. <laughs> because you made it more beautiful, so different people are not going to be attracted to live there. So the local people, when they see the, the trees, they were like, this is bad news for us, because it kind of takes away from the beauty of our neighborhood, and the beauty of our relationships that we have with each other. So, Turn that over to you guys. You worked on a gentr gentrification <laughs> issue, right? I mean, the problem is, at, of course, we should all be living in these kinds of neighborhoods and, and, and building them for ourselves. Um, I mean, beauty, that's one of the tragedies of the world is that beauty has become the possession only of people who can afford it. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've considered that to be a luxury rather than a mainstay. So, and I think it's very Whiteheadian to say, oh no, that's returning beauty to the center. So. Let's, let's take it. So we'll take a moment uh, as the setup transition, uh, and we're having uh, Professor Brian Donaldson, who's a postdoctorate fellow at Rice University. Next. I'm just going to circulate. I only have about 25 of these, but for those who are interested in a visual, go with a video component in the last few minutes. If you'd like to have one, I'll just pass this around. Is it helpful for me to pass them around? You can just let the people choose if they like okay. it. Okay. Okay.
Thanks, everyone. It's good to be with you all this weekend. When you live in a town with a pig slaughterhouse, you smell it and you taste it. Like rotten bacon and dog food, one colleague said to me, depending on what the plant was turning out that day. And you hear it too, and I didn't expect that when I took a job at a small liberal arts college in Monmouth, Illinois, home to farmland foods, a pork production facility now owned by Smithfield, the largest pork producer in the world that was purchased in late 2013 by a Chinese firm in the largest takeover of a U.S. company on record. Outside the local Shopco parking lot, you can hear the pigs squeal as they're offloaded. It's right in the center of town. High-pitched like a hundred rusty garage doors opening simultaneously while Descartes conducts. I want to start here in these sounds as an example of what Whitehead in Modes of Thought calls an expression, which is not at all general, but it's founded on the finite occasion, he writes, and is, quote, an activity of finitude impressing itself on its environment, end quote. And these pigs do impress. Their cries, like all animal sounds, including our own, asserts Whitehead, excite the intimacies of bodily existence. Voice-produced sound, Whitehead reminds, is a natural symbol for the deep experience of organic ex ex existence. But beyond these so-called so uh, sound impressions, the pigs are agents of America's changing heartland. These uh, seemingly docile bodies, they are called, paradoxically driving loops of migrations of people, corporate takeovers, ecological disruptions, exploding diversity on the local playgrounds, the flights of packaged flesh from nowhere Illinois to everywhere USA and beyond, China and India. And moving to this slaughterhouse town placed me right between all these multiple expressions, tied in a knot that I'm still trying to express. Expressions, claims Whitehead, come through the language of sounds from any kind of animal, as well as the language of writing. And this language has two intriguing aspects. First, toward itself, Whitehead says, language is the expression from one's past into one's present, and it bears within it, quote, the experience which it symbolizes. Now, this is surely worth considering when we think of the pasts that are being languaged in the sound speech of animals. What particular pasts are cried out in the present? What experiences are symbolized in these calls? And the second aspect of language is its role in civilization a becoming that is general enough to be considered what Whitehead calls important or interesting beyond the finite. So I want to think about expression as a mode of thought that might be akin to witnessing and thereby tug at the knots of practice that I still find myself in after two years in Illinois. The term witness from the Old English wit meaning to know refers to one who knows, one who attests, sees, possesses this specific knowledge but also the action of knowing, of testifying or protesting from the Latin testes, to certify or instruct or to observe in a multifaceted way. And it's the many-sidedness of the slaughterhouse town that ties the knot, I think. And on the one hand, there's the thread of my own past looming quite large. I grew up a meat eater in rural Michigan, surrounded by the unspoken foundations of 4-H fairs and family farms and Amish communities, that shroud animal exploitation in bucolic traditions. A series of events led me to encounter the realities of factory farming, even in nearby family farms. And the more I learned, the less I could deny, no matter how much I wanted to, that factory farming and the meat, milk, eggs, and cheese derived from those creatures was emotionally grotesque, theologically abhorrent, philosophically indefensible, environmentally apocalyptic and in every way a universal and absolute moral wrong of profound sorrow. While seeking my PhD, which I had hoped to put to use to undermine these systems, I worked as outreach coordinator for the international nonprofit Vegan Outreach in Southern California. And my territory was uh, to distribute leaflets from Bakersfield to San Diego in spite of my own introversion. <laughs> and I was heartened, though, by the organization's pragmatic philosophy to reduce suffering without all or nothing calls to purity, and students' courage to consider the, in the impact of their inherited habits. And I also participated in two successful civil liberty litigations that opened California campuses further for free speech. Still, taking a gig in a slaughterhouse town is not for the faint of heart, 
no matter how practiced and daily inhaling flesh on the air tied me in a thousand knots, holding together this uneasy balance of being an ethical and an academic outsider whose vegan critique increasingly and paradoxically bound me even more closely to the other threads of this place and its history and its people who could not simply be denounced. In my attempt to know everything I could about a slaughterhouse town, which was the, kind of the only way I thought I could take this job, I met its people, and so many of them shared with me candidly in formal interviews, slaughterhouse tours, trips to the ethanol plant, riding shotgun in a million dollar tractor, harvesting another thousand acres of seed corn destined for the guts of livestock. I met with the Burmese minister attending the community of refugees, staffing the kill floor, the Asian African grocer on the town square, teachers writing yet another grant to meet the needs of their expanding limited English proficiency students, nurses and police officers developing translation services for the 14 spoken languages at farmland. West African Muslims at the regional mosque carpooling to the kill floor, the Christian aid organization resettling refugees, and I always carried a pen and a good camera, sometimes jumping a fence to snag a shot of the hidden waste facility processing a city's worth of animal waste and blood every day, a dead pile of pigs when riding with a local hog farmer past her growing sheds. I jotted notes on bar coasters, chats at the grocery store aisle, at the local open mic where I played. How many of the contrasts and contradictions of life can you take in without being disorganized, thrown, or broke? Process thinker Bernard Loomer asks. Maybe too many, I thought at times. Because the truth is, I often wanted to burn the place down. I imagine paying one of the endless transport truck drivers to reroute to my pasture for a media event, staging a human chain at the gates, protesting with just the right persuasively worded sign. What would that say? Can you tell me what that would be? Taking out the CO2 machines that asphyxiated the pigs in this very modern slaughterhouse. Because it is one thing to accept Whitehead's perpetual perishing of time, or even his truism that life is robbery, indeed. But the socially sanctioned torture of animals from birth to early death is another thing altogether, and all the more when you are within arm's reach of the forsaken faces being trucked there. And then I'd find myself in the classroom trying to find ways to enable students' own investigation, having first-year students uh, create a public art exhibit of photos and interviews of local vegetarians in the heartland, faculty, students, even the town auto mechanic, you know, surprise, uh, <laughs> hosting an author Skype chat with Jonathan Safran Foer after reading his book, Eating Animals, uh, having uh, agriculture segments in my bioethics course, and exploring attitudes toward plants and animals in Indian philosophy class. And in my private times, I wrote uh, you know, the tools of sanity that we all have. I, I gave talks, I leafleted at the nearby agriculture university, I hiked, sometimes I drank an inordinate number of Jägermeister shots, and even when all else failed, I lit incense in a new kind of religion in the making, uh, even reciting an ancient Jain mantra of the Jains of India, said to be the most powerful and efficacious. Uh, being witness to systematic killing requires a range of responses a sort of groping experimentation, as Deleuze and Guattari put it, that might not appear very respectable, rational, or reasonable. And the persistent challenge was how to offer an expression of witness between an absolute ethical affirmation of the inviability of these marginalized bodies, lives, according to Judith Butler, that are not quite recognized as lives, on the one side, and then on the other, the need to stay in relationship with the other bodies whom I wish to learn from, and also persuade on the other. Always tied between the particularities of these pigs, <clears throat> these people, this place, and this language of civilization that's wide enough to symbolize all of these experiences without becoming just a feeble, facile relativism. So on an April morning earlier this year, I was headed out of town for a six hour trek to Minneapolis, and I was tied in the knot yet again. Now, passing transit trucks bound for the kill house is old hat. 200 bodies per truck, and the math adds up fast. 200, 400, 1,000, 2,000. You can just count the wheels rolling in toward the 10,000 that are killed every day there, 3 million a year. Sometimes I even saw trucks loaded with genetically modified piglets from the regional breeding facility, 1,800 per truck, bound for a local family farm as, as the new batch that will be killed through in six months. 
but not expecting to pass much beyond the typical inbound loads that day. I had only this old iPod and its grainy camera was suddenly put to use to follow his truck, strangely headed out of town, and for some reason only partially full, which I had never seen. It was headed toward the Iowa border, the largest pork producing state in the nation. So images from this camera, words stumbling out of my mind, created a visual speech event that contained, I think, countless experiences of the past, composed in a rather crude digital story a few days later, without knowing then that I would share it with you here today. I decided I would love you on Highway 34 West, headed to Burlington, on the second level of the Lennon Farms Incorporated truck from Eureka, Illinois. I pretended I had known you all along, and here I was following close to be sure you arrived at the beautiful place we were going together. When the truck hit a bump, you stumbled. Pink flesh pressed cold and red through the metal slats, and I cringed. We're almost there, I thought to you. When you poked your nose through, I smiled, knowing its shape, eager for my hand upon your familiar snout, feeling your ear, now flapping through the oval cutout in this bitter wind, from a thousand imagined strokes of that one spot that made your spine twist with pleasure. Reminding me again that all the stories were right. When they say that the wise see Brahman or Krishna in all things, Jesus in a lamb, the memories of gods gone in all things manifest. These bodies vibrant, electric with the truth subliving, wanting, reaching, pain, and the tiny delights incarnating that which cannot be seen, in the sacred size of skin touched by hand or by thought. Once I saw you, silly friend, stamp your feet and knock into the others, moving them out of your way. I knew you were impatient for greening grass, for the crackled straw you loved so well, the split rail fence you'd lean upon as the April evenings grew long into May, and then June, and the rest. Nearing the bridge of the Mississippi, the sun flared bright upon us both, and I knew you'd lift your face to soak it in, these rays glinting off the water that Mark Twain compared to medicine for the sick. The driver moved over once, giving me leave to go, but I would not pass because I was with you, riding with you to that new place. Though the fear and shit flecked upon my windshield, the stench through the vents, we would go together. Over the silent currents where the bald eagles coasted in winter, roosted high above the pocket islands where Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn crawled ashore, as you would scramble onto spring clover soon enough. I knew you'd sleep first, shaking off the roughness of this ride, the uncertain sea legs, finding your footing on solid ground shaded by red buds and the leaning hickory that would have to come down before too long. I too was tired from wincing at every crush and tumble, dreaming my head against your side, weary, a forgetful hand combing through the coarse hair of your belly after applying salve to places bitten raw by the truck's sharp teeth. I would drift off to your grumbles of complaint, slowed to grunts of ease, nestled in the respite of friendship, patterned dandelions speckling the hillside, secrets shared amid creatures so little known. Until the driver flashed his blinker, lumbering slowly onto exit 261, the bodies heaved and rolling as though on a steamboat rocked by a fallen timber, menacing under the water's surface vital cargo transported to ruin. The pictures suddenly grainy as pink faded ashen by distance between us that cannot be forgiven, but merely seen toward a place that I cannot go and you should never have to. Always wishing for you to tell me more and better the sounds and shapes of what it is to love the spectral forms, these ghosting stones residing in the blind spots of being human.
conclude, <coughs> I'm well aware that there was not one event that created industrial animal agriculture. It didn't fall from on high, and it will be a multitude of responses from each of us. Expressions from you and I, from policies, access to and interest in alternatives, cultivating new traditions, the resistant speech of pigs and hens and cows and calves over time that will undermine it. Such novelty, says Whitehead, requires the conceptual power to imagine an alternate and the practical power to affect it. Witnessing, I think, is an imprecise mode of thought and practice, an impossible knot of language that Whitehead claims joins the interdependence of thought with its expressive activities. And it can often feel utterly useless, struggling to maintain a moral primacy for vulnerabilities that are not at all equal, but all of which are expressions. How does one, or how do all of you, balance this expression of witness with the aim of language, as Whitehead puts it, quote, to convey the particular identities on which knowledge is based, end quote. To tell myriad actual stories at once for their own sake and for the sake of a general and abstract importance that will shape the ideals at which we aim toward the uprise of civilization. Comments, observations. Yeah, it, um, it feels like uh, it's an ode, it's a evocation that is at home in a number of different frameworks. It feels inherently pluralistic. I mean, we know you're a Whitehead scholar, we know you're a Jainism scholar, um, holding a Jainism chair or postdoc. Uh, is that true? Is, is there one frame? It feels like the particular lies at the center, the node, and that it can be read in many different ways. Is that true? Or is there a sort of necessity to privilege Whitehead? Any one that is consistent. Well, I don't think all metaphysical systems are equal. Um, is that enough? <laughs> um, <laughs> how pluralistic can we be? What if I said that the world lies there, which is how the poem goes? Right? The world is right there, that last picture. Can't we read that into so many conceptions? and mm -hmm. still do justice, do honor to that moment. Mm -hmm. Well, I think one has to do more uh, acrobatic philosophy with certain metaphysics. Um, certain metaphysics just don't have as much of a fluidity when it comes to um, articulating a space for the world-shaping power of everything in existence. I think Whitehead has a lot of power in that regard. I think the giant tradition has a lot of power. And I think that, um, but there's always power to be found. So, yeah, I'll think more on it. I'd like to hear your thoughts too. Um, I thought that was absolutely beautiful. Um, and I mean, I just, I, 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 I would worry in some ways that, um, I mean, I think, it's, I think it's far too beautiful to be reduced to any one metaphysical scheme. I think um, it would cheapen the work. And I'm, what I, I, I yeah. I would I think that any one yeah. conceptual or metaphysical scheme would cheapen the work. Uh, because I think what really, for me, what you're demonstrating is you're being, you're being moved to think by a series of um, bodies, technologies, and so forth that really function as a cause for thinking. Um, that you couldn't have approached in advance, or you wouldn't have known in advance um, how that was going to generate. Set of ideas or something like that. Um, so I mean, I, I was I was really quite moved by when you were talking about the pigs and cows and so forth, right? I mean, they, they function as as floating predicates, <laughs> you know, that become causes for thought and action. In your case, and I think that was, that was really really lovely. Thank you. I think the challenge is um, the difficulty is that if we will call a pig snout a floating predicate, I also have to call 
the uh, you know, female farmer who, after her husband's death, managed to create a independent, family-owned farm worth $15 million, right. who is responsible for the end of those smells. And I found her to be a compelling figure as well. Right. And that's where I really felt myself sort of uh, teetering on the edge of relativism uh, in a way that I was really uncomfortable with um, mm -hmm. and not quite sure what to do with it. Um, now, for me, I do have a, I do give primacy to the vulnerable, I'll, I'll rank these vulnerabilities. Um, but there was also a kind of, you know, is it Midwestern hospitality that gave me, even though they knew my angle, that gave me access to something. And I felt gratitude. I would, I, am, I embraced that farmer when I left and I thought, what the, what am I doing? And it was a genuine feeling of, of care and um, I don't know what to do with that. Um, thank you. I, I feel there's a really important conversation between the two papers. I, I was thinking, and this, is, this betrays where I'm coming from, but I can't, I don't want to have, uh, how should I put this? I, I, I was indoctrinated in philosophy in Berlin and with Heidegger, and it took me until I met Whitehead to know it was Whitehead I needed all along. And so I'm hesitant about ways of thinking that bracket life and death, because I want there to be, I think that's what I, what I found so extraordinary in Whitehead, that we could speak about the rock, we could come back to the rock, we could speak about a body as a society of molecules, we could think across those figures, we would have to ask the question that Adam was asking, that you were asking. And for me, what was extraordinary about the beauty was its discordance. And, and I think that, that that's partly how what you proposed, I mean, all of this made me think that what you're proposing is very strong in terms of how beauty can do its work in the world, which is not to resolve or to make something that we would understand as beautiful, but to activate that complexity of feeling that is precisely unresolvable and to follow the path to do the work. Um, and so I was just really moved by that and I'd be curious how I've, other people thought about it. And just to add another edge thought, I, I've been thinking a lot about uh, I, I work a lot around questions of trauma, and I've been thinking a lot about the way we, the way we use death, and this is, goes a little bit away from the idea of the pig, but it's still <laughs> allied to it. I hope you can see the link, but that we have a tendency, for example, if somebody dies of suicide, to say that they've lost something, that to make an assumption that the end of life is necessarily a loss of something. And we have a tendency also to say that if someone is old and they die, that they've lost less. And I think Whitehead gives us a way to think this differently, so that we're not presupposing value in one direction or another, and that this might give us the tools to think about the lack of value attributed to certain forms of life that are killable before they live. Hmm. Are you, well, So the last part seemed to kind of bind me up with the part you just said previous, so maybe I had a misunderstanding, but I would say having taught Indian traditions now for several years, the idea that there's a fluidity between life and death I think can be very helpful. And maybe sometimes it's been very helpful for me politically. You know, on the one hand, we have this sort of urgent political present. You know, do something, do anything, and do it now. You know, consequences almost be damned, right? And then there's this other sense of a kind of patient working to say uh, we do, we are all on our, our individual path. There isn't the need for homogeneity. There is time to yet uh, work this through. That opens up a space of freedom that is you're not just bound by a kind of stagnating immobility. Um, on the other hand, um, I want to be able to say that there is a definite distinction between life and death. And when one spends a lot of time with death, although maybe there are different perspectives on this, um, 
novelist John Irvine says, I know more now of death than I did before, and I can't say a word, <laughs> right? But I want to take death very seriously, and I want to take bodies and pain and fear and sorrow and separation from kinship systems and all of the things that are the heir to us. We have to take those with the utmost seriousness to know what's at stake and they're taken away. And they're only ever taken away for these creatures, right? There is a definitive line between life and death, and it is only the change of practice and the change of systems and the demand for alternates and innovation um, that includes these bodies into our community of concern, not just animals, but also plants and systems. Only when we can make that affirmation of life can we really start to engage the wages of life and death that are at stake. Um, because life is a robbery, until it's not. And I think Whitehead's notion of God or the Korah or the receptacle, as he talks about in Adventures of Ideas, it's not a value-free event. It's an event that is without obstruction. It's a unison of immediacy. It has an ethical pull in it of toward, I think, nonviolence. And I think that that has to have action with it. It has to have, uh, it has to have the decision for different kinds of beauty that are not um, shaped on to trying to minimize less and less loss. If I might add, I, I, I actually think we need to start using the word ugly also. And you know, it comes from the Norse word uga, which means dread. We should say that, uga. <laughs> it is dreadful. I mean, what, what you've described is dreadful. And, and I, I think we have to start to name that as well. So I, I do have a question though around, because I used to, Share a department at a 365 acres farm, and we had a lot of young people, you know, talking about humane, uh, humane raising of animals and humane killing of animals. Does the scale make a difference? Mm -hmm. um, there are people who I think have answered this question far better than I have, and I will point you, uh, without any shame, to the future of meat without animals, which is. Um, uh, a book that derived uh, out of my own living in a slaughterhouse town and wanting to see what alternatives could really be brought to scale to compete with industrial agriculture because uh, the meat industry is not just about our appetites, though our appetites certainly drive the market. Now with globalization, there is a need. You have to produce bodies to eat this corn. With subsidies, you have to produce bodies to eat the soy, right? There's, these are the only crops that are incentivized and someone has to do the eating. Um, and also now with markets globally, uh, the, the demand is coming from bodies that are far away from where these animals are raised. Um, that said, uh, anyway, so I wanted to look at the rise of plant-based and cell-cultured meat, milk, and eggs as an alternative, utilizing certain channels that already exist, but could it be scaled as a marketable and uh, competitive alternative with all the problems that that entails? In any case, one of the chapters in here deals with the question of humane farming, and what for me is a just a definitive essay, which I would be happy to scan for you. I would say that I always try to speak about factory farming because that's where 99% of food comes from. But most humane farmers, small scale farmers, uh, recognize that unless they dial their uh, ingestion of meat, milk, and eggs so far back, they themselves still remain 75% dependent on factory farming. And that within humane farming, there are so many levels still of violence, of kind of the removal of kinship bonds, the modification of bodies in order to force breeding, these sorts of things that are still in play. For me, I'm gonna always put my effort toward factory farming, but I think there are real philosophical issues to look at about the use of animals, even in a small scale. But I'm not gonna take issue, I'm not trying to make a universal statement for a farmer on the Andes Mountains, right? I'm trying to make a statement about the systems that uh, we are entangled with here in North America and which are spreading globally. Okay. Yes. Okay. You know what? So. It's hard to follow me, and she makes me cry. It's not you making me cry, but it's what, what you kind of bring to consciousness. And uh, 
She did that for years already for me, so <laughs> it's like, why, why do I have to follow you? <laughs> <laughs> Makes me cry too. Roland, well, didn't you design the schedule? <laughs> no, 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 only indirectly. So, so uh, I have to make a break with it, although in some way I will go in at the end, in a sense, in your direction, coming from a, from a different angle. What I would like to do first is a kind of exercise, okay? So we need some movement. Yes. If you would please set everything down and stand up. Look that you are kind of free in some way to move around. Yes. Yes. So the exercise is this. It's a pretty simple role. You kind of greet other people. And the way you do it is you, so there's a little touching coming with it, okay? <laughs> so you take the hands, or you touch the hands of someone else, and you have to always touch two people at the same time to greet them. And you can only leave a hand when you have done this, but you can't leave both hands before you haven't got someone else. <laughs> to greet always two people together at the same time. That's the point. You get it? Yes. You understand? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead.
Okay. So, so now comes the boring part. I have to talk again. Uh, and like when I when I saw that we had to read Nietzsche too, I was thinking of like if I had a laboratory featuring Aaron Ryan the Sense Lab and in their rucksack, they had Nietzsche, a hidden Nietzsche. <laughs> so kind of I have to go back to the Nietzsche text in some way with that exercise, and there would be other entries, obviously. But you might have realized, or you, you may realize, by doing this exercise, that there are certain elements of the Nietzschean text that comes to the fourth. For instance, you have lost your identity as an individual to some extent. You're still unique, but you are kind of distributed. You're looking for the others. You are decentered in some way. There is like feeling and consciousness go together in an interesting way that is not as personalized, not as individualized. You let go maybe of many things that are possessive, right? The possessive self is kind of subdued in some way and you open up to uh, seeking out these experiences, like a multiplicity, right? That in some way is connected and also disconnected at the same time, that is moving around and that kind of wills itself into existence in some way, but also stays always at the level of uh, not becoming too concentrated, aware, unified in some limited way. So things like that. And uh, I thought that the Nietzsche text brought me to think about Deleuze and Whitehead in, in these terms. Obviously, we have to discuss that to a certain extent, that these elements are present in their view too. And so my point is to say, so like this is the turn, my point is to say, in doing so, I think Nietzsche has become a mystical thinker. And what I mean by this is, he kind of shows not only the small consciousness that is self-centered or that is possessive, it is reducing its influence, reducing or, or kind of controlling its multiplicities. But in a sense, there is two, uh, three other consciousnesses in the text, more on the kind of edge of it. One is Nietzsche. So he conveys this to us. What consciousness does he have to know that, to be able to go into these structures? to become more sensitive to all of these influences that he realizes. What kind of unification is that? Do we trust it? Is it also a reductive self? Then we should not trust it, because any self is in some sense becomes reductive in this process, filtering out our compassion, maybe our feelings of the world, uh, our feelings of the body, and so on. And there's another one behind that, I think, in the text, and that is what I'm talking about when you talk about the mystic and consciousness, but one of two elements. One is to become perceptive of the manyness, the multiplicity of feelings in a compassionate way, in a way in which you decenter, in which you open up the channels that you have closed by your ordinary daily consciousness. And I think that always happens with Brian, with me, right? because then I have to cry. <laughs> by opening up to the, the passion and uh, the pain of Venus <clears throat> and seeing this in a wider context is uh, tragic and in a way makes me vulnerable, myself vulnerable, to be not possessive anymore. So this kind of the mystical consciousness is one that opens up. It's not one that kind of departs from everything in order to be up there, but that, that opens all of these channels that we have kind of sifted out in our daily kind of controlling daily life consciousness. And it has an other element to it. You feel in some way united with all of these beings or becoming with their feelings with their suffering. 
And in being so united, this consciousness is not your normal ego consciousness anymore. It's not, a, it's not the self, but it's not the multiplicity of the forces that are in me or in us together either. Something else. I find it interesting to look at Deleuze at this point in his late work. Uh, I mean, he identifies we are not individuals but singularities, so these multiplicities, but they are kind of arising in a context. If you want, he calls it the transcendental field or a field of immanence arising in it, but the consciousness of it, he calls in his late works, a pure consciousness, a pre-reflective consciousness, a consciousness without subject and object. So we lose our ability to create the objects by which we control the world, this kind of reflective, reductive consciousness. And at the same time, we lose our subjectivity in some way, this kind of subjectivity. But still, he calls it consciousness. And I think it whited this kind of consciousness appears as peace, the concept of peace. That's the one I'm after and the kind of paradoxes that it um, has for us, as we saw with the question of pain and suffering and how to also relate to the people who make others suffer at the same time, this complexity. So when Whited talks about peace, he says it's not about Ourself, right? It's beyond. It's something beyond that. He talks also about uh, tragedy, uh, this kind of tragic consciousness of opening up our channels and feeling with others, feeling the feeling of others, and not just human beings. Right? And he talks also of this consciousness as not being personal anymore, but not apersonal either, because that would be mechanistic in some way. He says, well, maybe it has to do with harmony, but you know, there's discord and stuff, so it's not easy harmony, not harmonization. Harmonization is again like closing down, filtering out, and so on. And he says it's also not love, because love always goes for something specific uh, opposite to other things. Not always, but this kind of concept develops there. It's always like Shizek saying if the world was created by love, that's really ugly, it's really a bad thing. Uh, by, by kind of filtering out something instead of everything else, right? So it is something that is wider. It's not kind of kind of limiting us. This is what he calls peace. That's some kind of this kind of consciousness, I think, that he's talking about. He also, and that is uh, kind of the point of the paradoxes, as Brian said, <clears throat> he identifies this consciousness or peace with ultimately mutual immanence. The term in in in. Uh, Adventures of ideas. And what it implies for him is a kind of unimaginable relationality of things. But that at the same time is, let me say this this way, is gentle enough to allow the opposites to happen. Right? That does not force. He calls it also persuasive instead of coercive and, and all these elements. And he loved the term gentleness, in fact, as important for the development of civilization, which can only happen if we become de desubjectivized and also lose <clears throat> the objectivities by which we create our world and kind of get the feeling at the edges of our consciousness, he says, of this kind of consciousness, the peace consciousness. So the paradox that you mentioned exactly is there. So if Values can be created in different ways, in different contexts. If there is a value to people to survive by being working at the slaughterhouse, and you could be compassionate with you know, them surviving, but also you had the animals killed at the same time, being kind of compassionate with that too. What does that mean? How can that happen together at the same time? How then can this mutual immanence be somehow gently the background for all that. How can, how can, we, how can we understand that? I, I don't, really. I would like to. That's the point. Like, how do you make peace, so to say? Right? How can you understand this to happen? And if you try to realize peace in this form, this kind of consciousness, it always becomes enmeshed again in our selective everyday, possessive,
consciousness in the reductionism. So you realize it and at the same time lose it. In some way, in the double sense of the word, you betray peace by realizing it. That's another paradox that kind of comes up for me in this context. So in the end, <coughs> we're doing exactly one minute. Yeah. Uh, so in the end, when Whitehead identifies what he calls a person with the Korah, which is basically the mutual immanence of everything, like a streak or stream within it, how can we become such that we realize the elements of the core or the mutual immanent existence as values over values of competition, values of creating suffering, values of destruction of relationships instead of creating. And this, I think, was a basis of our discussions up to now that we presuppose these values, but they are not actually, peace is not a value in this sense, but it's kind of a value maker, or it's like the foster mother of values <laughs> that, that kind of gently want us to realize these values more than others. How can that be? if it at the same time lets everything else happen too. Okay, that's it. So we have time for some comments, uh, either about the activity or the <laughs> talk. Um, I think, or out of my experience, I, I think that the highest event of creativity, yes, in the highest event of creativity, the gift of creativity <clears throat> is exactly what you described. Because then we lose our subjectivity, our person, our self, and we gain what Deleuze calls singularity, and he describes it so beautifully in when he's referring to the Dickens mutual <coughs> friend, uh, the, the capitalist Mr. Riddlehood uh, between life and death, struggling between life and death. And, and Mr. Riddlehood is really relieved, and his, all his face is going in, in a beautiful shining because he is getting rid of it himself. And in, at the moment, and the empathy around him uh, is another uh, uh, reaction, is the reaction of, the, of this happening. And at the moment he's gaining life again, he is himself again. And this gift of, in, I think the gift of creativity opens up this field of immanence, that life itself opens up. And yes, and that, I think this is the obsession to being on stage. Maybe. Well, okay, let me, let me add this here, because, I think. No, once more, but yeah, that, uh, because all the potentiality <laughs> opens up that a, a, a yeah. human being has. It increases immensely. And then after uh, going uh, in the garden, that's the pity of all of that. Another way to say it would be uh, taking up Nietzsche again. You can, so peace is not a concept. Uh, you have to dramatize it. You cannot apply it. And every dramatization, and, and you had a very tragic dramatization of it in our minds. I, I tried to have another one. Every dramatization is limited, finite, and perishing sure. again. Right? This is part of that creative process. So we never get to the point to really realize it, although it is already the background by which we realize anything. Just to add one, to go back to the classical mythology, because of harmon harmon harmonizing. Harmonia <coughs> is the illegitimate daughter of Aphrodite and Ares. Yeah. I think this is an interesting couple. <laughs> <laughs> so there's nothing to do with harmonizing. Oh, yes. No, I'm saying like, like and he, just to, he to wanted to avoid harmonizing, and he did so yeah, this with So I wanted to start with this very simple thought in many Indian traditions, which is a distinction between mind and consciousness. And it's very simple, but I come to it all the time because it feels like a really important distinction that the idea that the mind or the ego, the eye maker, is called in a lot of Indian 
thought is precisely not consciousness. Right? That separative self is the is the di that's the illness that's diagnosed, and the accessing of consciousness is the cure, right? In a sense, and yet it's a cure that is meant to, after uh, apprehending it, meant to then inform the, the eye maker to go and do otherwise, right? So there's you never unless you're talking about moksha or nirvana. Uh, which are in some cases almost like Whitehead's notion of God. They're almost this sort of limit case occasion, which maybe it functions as a lure rather than a goal to reach. It's always there to be folded back in. You, you're going to keep both of them, but somehow the content of the, the ego begins to change as it accesses consciousness. And in that sense, I think there's also a real connection to a, a dis difference between the idea of empiricism in Indian thought. Here, it's like in, in the, the West, this is a problematic way, but in the West, it's like we just we can observe something, but there's no value claim. But there, there's a sense that if you begin to know something and you understand it, uh, behavior will naturally usher forth from that. So then you have this different way of understanding both self and consciousness and how transformative action happens through observation and attention that are very different from those two ideas, consciousness and empiricism, in, um, as we typically think about it in Western philosophy. And then I think if you take those ideas and you think about Whitehead's concept of peace, which I don't remember was it Adventures of Ideas where he says it's when interest is transferred to coordinations wider than personality. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, and then, so how does one do that while sort of, you can only do it in the self that you have, right? <laughs> the subject has to be the thing, and yet there's this constant effort to, trans to, to transfer to coordinations wider. And then there's the respite. This is why I'm always, we don't want to give away subjectivity, because we find a respite in our subjectivity. And then we go out, and then we have to return again, and it's, you know, he says, you know, to go for the adventure of peace, which adventures are exhausting and hard, and they're not always just like fun backpacking trips, as opposed to anesthesia, right? So this adventure of peace, and I think that there's there's some ideas that have to be sort of pulled out differently because there is a value claim that's being made in all of this work that it's there's a towardness. Whitehead's actual occasion is not value free; it is valueful. There is an ethic, I think, in Whitehead, and it's very strong. It's not just aesthetics, like create something and jumble it together. Uh, the more, the merrier. It's for the sake of, you know, dot, 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 of peace, which is a non-obstructive state. Yeah. A lot he of also calls it, I, I think it's, it's page uh, 285 and 286, yeah, right? Yes. He calls it also a gift, something you cannot possess, which is exactly the point. If you begin to possess it, then you are back. Thank you so much. I just had a very direct question, um, and I'm not very familiar with Whitehead on the tragic, and I wondered if you, that came up in relation to consciousness and peace and compassion, and I just wondered if you could expand a bit, or if anyone else is familiar with, with his comments. Exactly. Yeah, he makes this, I mean, he, it appears at certain places, but, but one of the comments is about uh, peace. The, there's, there's a more complicated formulation that I slip my mind now that, that kind of uh, not perpetuates but kind of conveys the tragedy that, that has happened but is still beyond it in a sense but it doesn't forget it you know it's not forgetfulness mm -hmm. just it's it's being open to all of these feelings that were tragic the past is not just disappear curativity means not turn around and walk away it's becoming actually much more open to it without the necessity to turn around. So there is some kind of healing to it. And it's kind of very yeah. He also talks about tragic <coughs> beauty, which would relate to the to the other uh, paper, the first paper we had in some way, uh, which is kind of uh, a way of saying that this kind of ultimate consciousness cannot escape the factual or the, ha the happenings by which it was pluralized in the world, right? Okay, we're running a little bit over time, but I've got one here, one there, and then I'm stopping. Thanks. Um, just on the 
sort of paradox is a piece here in White Hedge Process Philosophy is the notion of permanence. And Ed Tibetan's idea he says he says an intuition of permanence. So I'm sort of asking about that permanence. What is the permanence that piece intuits? Well it, it's I think it's a well <laughs> the I think the direct context of it is that what is impermanent is so consciousness, this kind of peace consciousness, is cannot be realized at any point. Although it's the condition for the realization. So the striving for the permanence is the striving for the most intense harmonious realization of that peace. In dramatizations in this world, which at the same time wants to be permanent because of the rich value of it, but cannot in fact do so. Right? Because it's always impermanently overcome by other traumatizations or realizations or actualizations in this way. So yes, there's the strive for consciousness, which is in these values ethically, aesthetically and ethically, but cannot be reached. Ever. My friend. Oh, you, know, you know it's my role to be grumpy. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> there, was a, there was another paradox to do with the activity which is that, I mean, oh, this will get back to tragedy, oh, is that it relies upon <laughs> exclusion because one had to not include some people in order to include the two. So that might be dealt with in terms of negative apprehension. But it's also the idea that for there to be novelty, the other side of it, and this is the tragedy, is there has to be perpetual perishing. Exactly. But anything, for there to be creativity, there has to be exactly the yes. same amount yes. of, uh, exactly. Yes. Exactly. of uh, yeah. perpetual perishing. Exactly. So you have to lose the connections that you had in order for there to be new connections. That is at the end of adventurous ideas we've got. That's the tragedy. Yeah. Brexit. It's, 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 <laughs> it's, 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 uh, there has to be a, a, a counterbalance of, of death for there to be novelty. Yeah, exactly. That's the point. That, me saying that it's always impermanent, but it also in the double sense of the word betrays the peace, yeah. right? betrays it, conveys it, but also at the same time loses it. I mean, I would argue so, that beauty is the consolation of the word permanence. So there is some way in which there is that kind of peace. I think that would be probably a longer discussion. I, I think why did introduce the concept of peace in order to alleviate the turmoil that comes in through beauty, I think, in the adventures of ideas. I know, Timothy, I'm going to see if I can get him before you. Uh, <laughs> no, he, be, be strong, Timothy. Be strong. Okay. <laughs> well, so I just wanted to say one thing. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say something about tragedy. Because I really tried to work this through in Creature of the Cosmologies, and the way I did it was I wanted to not use Whitehead's language, and I started thinking about a virtual hard drive. And virtu like, like God or the actual event or the core or the receptacle as a virtual hard drive that can hold everything, particularly, specifically because it's virtual. It's not limited by form and function. So perpetual perishing in the actual, yes, that's the cost of tragedy. But it's not the last word because yes. Whitehead puts forth this yes. idea of, of something where perpetual perishing does not hold, right? It's, it's the thing that through tenderness and patience can save even that which was excluded, that which could have been and was not. That which in the mere world is the world is mere wreckage, right? So that there's this what is preserved forever in the mind of God, right? This is the permanence that there's this sort of unison of immediacy, this hard drive that's out there as this uh, this event to always be that keeps everything that has been lost and everything that's excluded, which gives us some permission to exclude. I think when we have to make real decisions about who we're going to give privilege to, uh, pigs or the people making the cash off the pigs, right? Um, but that this permanence, and I think it, like in modes of thought, Whitehead says, morality is the ability to imagine an alternate, but religion is what gives it its kind of value. And I think that, you know, I don't know, you know I've argued with you about religion and God, and like, why did he have to do this? And of course, you've convinced me that he had to, he had to bring this idea of God back because it's the remedy of perpetual perishing. It's not our remedy because we are limited by form and function. But that it's not the but perpetual perishing is not the last word in my head, and that's what makes some of his writing so beautiful. That there is this possibility to strive toward. 
fix it. Let that let's, be. Let's, 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 let's that be. <laughs> We now have a, about a 20 minute break, so people can be back. Okay.